I started my career in forestry in 1993 with the Department of Natural Resources. I, they, they had a pole team out of Olympia where they traveled around the state setting up pole sales. So I, I started there and that's where I learned poles. Um, I hired on to McFarland Cascade in 2000 buying poles and then uh, Stella Jones bought McFarland Cascade and then we, we transitioned to McFarland Cascade, a Stella Jones company for a while and a couple of years ago we just decided to go with Stella Jones. Even though I, I was saying that my paycheck still says McFarland Cascade Pole and Lumber Company. So I don't understand how all that works. But anyway, it does. Um, so one thing about poles is Douglas fir poles are very kind of a, a, a unique type of product. Um, the range of Douglas fir poles is uh, very limited. Um, you can see by the, by the outline there, that's generally the range where we find Douglas fir poles. There's some up in, in uh, Canada, some on Vancouver Island. Um, down in Oregon, they go a little further west towards the coast range. But you can see it's a very, very narrow band that fits Douglas fir poles. We go too far out west, um, they don't have the right form, a lot of defect. I'm not saying that there isn't any. Um, we get poles out of areas, you know, they're close to forks and things like that sometimes. So just because it, it says here we don't make poles that far west, <coughs> sometimes we do, it depends on the stand. Uh, but generally we don't. Uh, cedar poles are very good for us further west. Um, and then as you proceed east, anything typically over the, the Cascade Range is considered inland Douglas fir, which is not suitable for pole manufacturing because of the way it treats. It doesn't treat properly. Um, one, one thing I'll say about poles is these, these get shipped all over the nation, especially the longer poles. They go, there's, transmission poles are, are grown here. They're not grown anywhere else in the country. And they get shipped all over to the east coast. They get shipped down to the southeast. A lot of them go to the southwest. So I almost think that it's a strategic resource we have here in Washington and Oregon for these big long poles. Um, as you can see here, here's Lewis County. You guys are more acquainted with Lewis County than I am. But there's a lot of private land in Lewis County. And we rely on private landowners like yourselves to, uh, to help source poles. We have pole yards in uh, Curtis, Little Rock, or not Little Rock, um, Ar uh, Rochester, and Arlington here in Washington. Um, our closest Oregon yard is in St. Helens, and we've got a buyer there that will come across and handle anything in southern Washington. So the strength of the pole market. Our, our current demand remains very strong. Doug, Fleur, Doug Fur and especially Red Cedar for poles 40 foot plus. This has been a trend since about 2010 with increasing needs almost every year. Right now the potential for future business is more than, more than can be met by existing pole companies. We're, us, our competition, we're telling Utilities, no, we can't, we can't produce the poles that you need. Uh, there, there's a huge demand for them. And it, the bottleneck is really treating. It's hard to get a treating plant built. It's hard to get it permitted. Um, pole yards are a little easier, but the, the bottleneck is really treating. Um, it's not the supply of trees. Uh, it, it, it can be. The, with, with the way the rotations are, are coming down in age, it, that's that's problematic for us and we we feel that all throughout the country so in the southeast our southern yellow pine program the the rotation down there is is becoming younger and younger and now we're having to substitute dug fir poles into what was formerly a strictly a yellow pine market one thing about poles is 
they can be used to increase your profits. Poles are usually the almost always the highest paying product on your landing. Um, we're, we're very flexible with how we manufacture poles on the landing. We're, we're, we're going to help you utilize the, the timber to your benefit. We'll never tell you that if you're selling X, Y, and Z sort, if you're selling export logs or what have you, we'll never tell you that we're not going to buy your poles. We will always come and look at your poles and help you manufacture and utilize your trees to the best ability to help increase your profits. Um, some things to know about poles is you need to know some of the terms. A candidate, it's a standing tree that, that has the potential to become a pole. And this, a lot of these are terms that we utilize ourselves internally. Uh, classing point, commonly called the ground line, but it's not really the ground line, but the classing point is the point of measurement up six foot. And that's how poles are made in the yard. They take a circumference, six foot up, and that tells you what class and length you can make out of that pole. Uh, the ground line, sometimes called or confused with the classing point, is actually how deep the pole's going to be buried. Um, class and length. So everybody knows the length of poles, but the class is the top size. And that determines, they, they use that for engineering purposes, so... A class one pole will carry more load than a class four pole. An H6 will carry a lot more load than a class four or class five. And if you, I presented or left some pole cards there over at the table and I'll have here that we can talk about. Uh, barkies, that's a pole that's still in its bark form. Distribution poles are poles 55 feet and shorter. Transmission poles are poles 60 foot and longer. Though our, our sorts are a little different than that. Uh, H-class poles are just a heavy class pole. We can have H-class 45s or H-class 125s. They're just a, a stouter piece. What we call a scaler and inspector, they're the people at the peeler that make the call to determine what class and length pole you're going to make. And then whitewood, in our industry, white wood is a peeled pole. It's not hemlock or, not that we don't get some hemlock in there accidentally sometimes, but uh, our white wood is, is a peeled pole. Uh, some prohibitive defects that are good to know in poles. Uh, spike knots or sucker knots are a prohibitive defect. Not saying we can't make a pole that has a spike knot in it. We, we allow a one by four spike knot if there's no deviation in the bowl or there's no bark inclusion and I'll have some pictures of bark inclusions and the reasons why they're not uh, acceptable. Uh, short crooks or snow break, splits or bucking break, shake, scars, cat faces, deadwood streaks, uh, cross break, falling break, mechanical damage, decay or uh, insect damage and then excessive sweep or sweep in multiple planes. Um, Off-center hearts, that, that's fine with us. It doesn't bother us at all. Um, and then, yeah. Factors that can limit, or yeah, limit stamp potential. Geographic location, like I mentioned, we don't generally go out towards the coast and we don't go over the Cascades. Your site index, uh, usually a high growth site, doesn't tend to uh, grow poles very well. Uh, species mix, if you have maple, alder, and dug fir growing together, chances are you're not going to have m very many poles. Age and rotation, typically uh, the, the older the stand, the better the poles, but we do get a couple loads a week from Weyerhaeuser, and they're 38 to 42 years old, and we get some some 30s and 40s and sometimes some 45s out of them. It just depends. A uh, stand density, uh, the denser the stand, the, the nicer the pole. Uh, you guys know that if a stand isn't very dense, they tend to get limmy and bushy and they're short and don't have the right form for us. Straightness, a lot of, there's a lot of misconceptions about defects and straightness. We ask for line straight. 
Uh, the ANSI spec is sometimes less stringent than what we ask for, and I'll cover that a little bit. Um, ANSI is the minimum spec, and a lot of our customers want better than ANSI. Um, so the following slides will have examples of sweep, excessive knots, spiker, uh, spike and sucker knots, and some fast growth. So uh, ANSI, the, the ANSI spec allows one inch of sweep for every 10 feet of pole measured from the actual ground line. The formula for setting a pole is generally 10% of the pole height plus two feet. So a 60 foot pole will have eight, eight feet in the ground. So you would measure the sweep from the eight foot mark to the tip. A 120 foot pole will have 14 feet in the ground. This is a 45 here shown. Um, its ground line will actually be six and a half feet. And with, with the uh, one inch of sweep, that'll give you 3.85 inches because the ground line is going to be six and a half feet. So measuring from side to side, from the ground line to the top, the tape can actually come off that pole 3.85 inches and still be legal. Here's a picture of, of an inspector measuring the sweep on a pole. And that was a legal pole. Here's an example of something. Maybe, maybe the landowner should have taken five feet off the top, and that would have made a decent pole. But you know, just some here's some sweep. The one in the middle here that's shaped like a bow. That one's not going to make it, but the others would. Here's one with a, with a an S shape, so we like sweep in one plane. That way the, the lineman can face it. You don't see, you know, you don't, you don't look down a, a line of telephone poles and have tops. The tops are all facing one way, and they use the sweep to do that. Uh, here's a short, a short crook that's not very good. That one probably didn't make it. Then we've got some excessive knots. The rule for knot for poles 50, for 50 foot and shorter is one third the circumference or eight inches, but not to exceed 12 inches. For poles 55 and longer, it's one third the circumference or 10 inches of knot, but not to exceed 14. Uh, half inch and smaller knots are ignored. Uh, typically a single three inch knot is something that uh, that we don't like, we'd probably kick it out if it was bigger than that. Here's an example of, you know, excessive knots. Uh, it creates a weak point and, and doesn't meet the ANSI spec. You guys are familiar with spike or sucker knots. Here's a few good examples. Uh, the one on the right is what we call a sidewinder. Uh, easily determined by the boat shape wake. If you see if you see a like a boat wake coming out of a knot, that's typically not a good sign. Uh, here's a younger stand that has a lot of movement to it and a lot of spike knots. I'm not saying you couldn't get a few poles out of there. Uh, a good logger might be able to get a few, but it'd be awful hard out of this stand. Uh, here's a shot of a spike knot with a bark inclusion. The reason why we don't like bark inclusions is the bark doesn't treat. So that creates an avenue for decay, rot, insects, and all, all sorts of different things that can uh, harm the pole once it's in service. Uh, here's some more examples, cross section of spike knots. You can see the bark inclusions on both of these. That uh, They all go all the way down to the heartwood, and that's why we don't that's why we don't like them. They, in some cases, moisture and everything can get in there, and during the treatment process, they, they can actually explode. Now, they don't blow the retort up or anything, but the trees will, will come apart. Uh, sapwood is a consideration that we ask, that we look at. Uh, we like one inch of sapwood. That's what accepts the preservative. Um, but for because of the way we frame and, and process poles, 35s, or I'm sorry, 45s and longer, we can get by with 
three quarter inches of sap. We we do a through boring process that drills holes through all the way through the poles around the ground line and when that gets treated the preservative gets pushed up and down to above and below the the ground line so it, it protects it that way from rot. Um, ring count uh, we ask for a minimum of six rings per inch in the outer three inches. Here's an example of on the left, two rings per inch, and on the other side, five rings per inch. So that would be rejected for fast growth. Um, it, it's not a huge reject factor, but we do keep an eye on it. Uh, like I said, the, the loads from Warehouser, we watch a rot. Here's, here's a, this is a pine pole that has blue stain, and that's perfectly fine. So stain is allowed but no, no soft rot or no rotten knots. Here's an example, soft rot. We would uh, try to buck that out, make the pole shorter. Um, rotten knots are really hard for you guys to, to find. We usually don't find them until they're in the yard and peeled. But here's the, one, the picture on the right is an example of a rotten knot and you can see how into the heartwood that, that decay pocket goes. Spiral grains, another defect. Um, it's not all that common. It usually happens in older timber. Um, so the maximum twist allowed for 30 foot and less is one full twist in 10 feet. 35s and 45s, you're allowed one full twist in 16 feet. And then 50 foot plus, you're allowed one full twist in 20 feet. And what will happen is you know, when they start, you can see the checking here that the pole will want to kind of spin itself apart. The checks will get real deep and, and uh, there's a lot of uh, utilities that don't like any spiral grain at all. Here's an example of one, you, you can see the spiral grain right there, plain as day. Uh, mechanical damage is probably our biggest defect that we run into and it can happen from a lot of different reasons. Um, you know, probably most of this is all loader damage or shovel logging damage. Uh, we consider it, we'll call a piece for uh, machine damage if it penetrates the sapwood and gets into the heartwood. If we can clean it up with a wood wood miser or something like, not a wood miser, but a, oh, what's the, a, oh, a log wizard. We use the log wizards to help clean up the poles. It's a planer head on a chainsaw. If we can clean it up without penetrating the, uh, the sapwood, then it's usually pretty good. And one inch is kind of what we consider the maximum. So on the left here, that's pretty extreme. Um, you know, the damage can result from yarding, handling, falling. The, uh, the picture on the right, that's probably falling damage where that tree hit a stump. Um, and even unloading at our yard can damage poles. But our folks are supposed to let us know when they damage a pole and nobody's penalized for that. Uh, kind of an interesting defect is a is what we call a driven knot. It's where a limb or a stob is, is driven into an, a pole. So it can either be a tree falling on a tree or the, the tree that's on the ground, something falling on that. It's, it's, a, it's a limb and it's a wooden knot. And what it does is it causes damage that penetrates the, the sap wood and it fractures the, the wood underneath. The picture on the right, it doesn't show it very good, but the wood, the wood cells are fractured all the way down to the heartwood. And then you, on the picture on the left, you can see there's cracking up and down. And that creates weak points. So when it comes to buying poles or us selling poles, there's certain things you need to, need to know. So here's a list of our sort definitions. And we use pack rim here in Washington. Uh, down in Oregon, they use a couple different scaling bureaus. I'm not sure. Yam Hill is one, and maybe Mountain West is another. 
it depends on the pole yard. But here in Washington, we use all pack rim. And these are the sort, de sort definitions that we've defined that pack rim uses. Uh, purchase agreements will reference these sort codes for pricing. And uh, the payment backup will, will mention these as well. One thing to keep in mind about poles is they're in five foot increments. Uh, they start at 25 feet and typically go up to 140. And we, I don't know, we might buy four or five 140 foot poles every year between Washington and Oregon and they'll sit around for two or three years and then we'll cut them back to something that someone wants. But if somebody wants a 140 foot pole, where do you go find it if you don't already have it? it they're hard to find. Um, one thing, the, the industry doesn't reference trim our when we're talking about poles, we're you know, we talk 45s, 50s, 55s, and that's, assume, that's all assuming they have a foot of trim. You know, loggers, like, they like to call them 46s, 51s, 56s, but that's kind of not how we do it. Um, but we always assume a foot of trim on every pole. Uh, we can get by with less. So maybe if it broke or something like that, we can get by with six inches of trim. It just may, when you segment scale, it may change how that, that pole gets scaled. Uh, so so no maximum butt um, it, it depends on the class and length of pole. Typically, Rochester can peel up to about a 32 inch butt. Curtis is more like a 30. Um, a lot of it depends on on the shape of the butt. If it if it's a nice round butt with with no hook on it, yeah, we can we can do 32 pretty easy. Other than that, we might have to shave it down a little bit. And those big pieces, if you ever if you've ever seen the peeler, a big long pole can get quite a bit of movement and momentum going, and it's really hard to peel. And one thing to keep in mind is if you guys want to put a field trip together, you can always come to one of the pole yards and we'd be happy to have you and show you what we do. Um, so the sort code, like a, our 135 sort is commonly referenced. We're not really buying the one, the 130 sort, that's a pole 30 foot and longer. Uh, there's not a real demand for us for 25s and 30s, though a couple years ago we were buying quite a few of those. So most of our purchase agreements will reference sorts 135, 145, 160, 180, 195 and 114 and so like a, a 135 sort that means minimum 35 foot um, and, it, and it has a, a minimum butt diameter of 11 inch and a minimum minimum top diameter of 7 inches and when talking about poles almost every measurement we talk about is minimum um, you know 180 sort is kind of a that's kind of a unique one because it only goes from 80 to 95 feet long but we developed that is to create an ability to buy heavy H class very stout large poles you know an 85 foot pole with maybe a 16 inch top there's a demand for some of those um, and then the, the other sort codes what they do is they allow us to break our pricing down to meet our needs if we want to, if we need to focus on 45s, um, you know, our, or like class two 45s, well, our 145 sort will have a different price. A lot of times they're all the same, except we we do have a price break at 165. So we consider 135, 145 sorts typically very similar in pricing, um, and then 165 to 195, depending, can be similar or or they can have varied pricing too. Uh, the 114 sort is the color reject and that only gets used if a pole gets sent in that's obviously a reject, if, it, if it's broken in two, if, it, if it's obvious it shouldn't have been put in um, Other than that, it'll get scaled as a pole, you get paid as a pole. If it fails further in the process, you've already been paid for it as a pole and we we take the hit on that and we market it the best we can after that. And let's see. Okay, so here's a pull, pull card here. Um, the one on the left rent references class and length. You can see 
but minimum top size on the right is class six, that's the smallest, and H6 all the way to the left is the largest. And you can see those are minimum top sizes uh, listed for the class and length of pole. Uh, there's really no maximum top size, and I hate to say that because it, it gets to the point that it, you're better off just making a log out of it, I think. Um, we typically allow three inches over, but there is no maximum top size uh, other, other than for resource purposes. Uh, if we have a lot of excessive tops, we'll come out and talk to you, try to try to uh, get the top size down. We actually like helping to merchandise, maybe take an export log off the butt and then push the top further into the, into the limbs to help get the top size down. But these are minimum tops. And the butt size listed for each one is minimum as well. And you can exceed the minimum butt size by 20% and still make the same class and length pull. Uh, the pull card on the right is typically favored by processor operators. It's simple. Um, they can memorize it pretty good. And uh, other people like, if you've done it for a while, you like the card on the left. That way you know exactly what class and length pull you're making. And if, if you do buy on a price list, which we don't do all that often anymore, um, that can help, help you guide you to what polls you want to make. Um, like I said, our pole scaling is done by pack rim. Everything's rollout scale at, at Curtis, Rochester, and Arlington. Um, we double end scale, measure the tops and the butts. Uh, fairly minimum scaling deductions. If you see a scale sheet, there's usually not much deduction in the, in the scale, but they will deduct for rot, excessive hook, flare, splits and breaks. And then they're all segment scaled. A pole, a 40 foot pole is gonna be, or shorter is gonna be one segment. 45s to 80s have two segments. 85 to 120, three segments. And 125s and longer have four segments. And they try to, they, they, they try to do even segments the best they can. But like a 45, you're gonna have a 22 foot segment and a 23 foot segment. But the, the shorter segment will always be the butt log. Uh, again, we, we still do a little bit of priceless work, um, which is an individual price per piece by class and length. Or if things worked out, we, we wouldn't mind buying by the ton either. If they're typically all the same or close to the same size, we could work out a ton price. The problem is we don't have scales that are yard, so that makes it difficult. Um, our, for ourselves, we, we pay a lot of trucking on truck scales, and people have different comfort levels based on that. But uh, the, the, the folks we deal with, we've dealt with a long time, have a pretty good a relationship with. So there's some common misconceptions about poles. One is that poles need to be long. Everybody likes the the 120, 110 foot poles. But to be honest, we need more 45 foot poles than just about all the other lengths combined. 45 foot pole, minimum 11 inch butt, is our, is our biggest demand. Uh, we have a hard time meeting them. We've got customers in Southwest that want 10, over 10,000 every year. And it's almost impossible to meet that demand. So we'll, we'll have to try to substitute in some of our southern yellow pine, some of our red pine from Wisconsin, even some cedar occasionally to keep them happy. Another uh, common misconception is that poles need to be clean or export type quality logs. They don't. There's no grade in poles. You can have, you can have a pole that has limbs all the way down to the butt. Um, no grade in poles. It just, they can't have excessive knots. It's those prohibitive defects that they can't have. Um, another common misconception is that poles need to be made from the butt, that from the butt log. No, a lot of the poles we make, especially in timber sales we buy and things like that, they're second or even third cuts. 
because we're trying to find every pole out there. So we'll we'll cut the sweep out of the the butt log. We'll make a peeler export log. You know, if it, we don't export ourselves, but um, you guys do, and we'd be more than happy to take an export log and then get a pole on top of that. That what that does is it helps the form. It helps get that top size more into the limbs and into the taper, and you're getting pole price for something which it's a domestic type log. That's kind of where you you, you can make some extra money there. Um, poles need to be perfectly straight. That's a misconception. They don't. You guys got a brief idea of how much sweep we can get away with. They can be pretty ugly and still make a pole. Um, poles need to be marked in advance. That's another misconception. We do mark poles for people. Um, it, it depends on the logger. Um, but a, a good pole logger will make more poles than we can mark because seeing those pole segments up 32 feet can be very difficult in the brush or aspect. Uh, it's really hard to identify those upper stem pole segments. And a good logger, a good processor operator will see those as he's processing logs. And another misconception is poles are hard to make. They're really not. They're just another sort. Um, and that, the long poles, yeah, okay, they're hard to truck, they're hard to handle, they need extra landing space, but like I said, we need more 45s than any other length of pole, and that fits on a landing just fine. And once you learn to make a, a, a once you learn what we want, they're pretty easy to make. Uh, yeah. Um, on a conventional log truck, what is the longest pole? Typically 55 inch. A processor, you know, the processors that kind of make marks on the logs that they're putting in, them, them are okay. The, the marks are okay. We ask that you don't go back and forth multiple times. Um, if the processor spins out, that can be an issue. But no, we, we peel off the processor marks all the time. You know, when the bark's slipping, we ask people to be a little careful and maybe turn the pressure down a little bit if they can. But if you have sapwood, we can, we can peel it down and get rid of those. We don't like to do that because that, we've already paid for that scale that we're losing, but we can do that. Um, now here's something that may or may not interest you. Every, every pole that's put into production, whether it's made by us or our competition, has a pole tag at the at the face, the face of the pole. And on that tag, you can tell what company it's made by. So this is Stella Jones Corporation. Uh, the month and year it's made, the class and length, class two, it's a class two, 45. Um, it's PG&E is the, is the end consumer. The DFDA is the Douglas Furs, the species. The D is the treatment. So we're using a treatment now called DCOI. Don't ask me, I can't pronounce what that actually means. It's a big long chemical term. But it's replaced Penna is the, is the treatment here in the United States. Um, the point two is the preservative retention and the A is the type of carrier oil that's used for the treating. And then you can see it was produced in Tacoma, Washington. That's where it was treated anyway. And the SQC is a, it means it's part of a quality control program. And oh, and the A is, means that there, there's an assay. Uh, that's how the retention is determined. We have a lab in Tacoma that does a lot of the uh, um, measurements and retention levels and things like that. But every pole has them. So you'll see, I, I wander around baseball fields and look at all the poles and wonder when that was made and this and that, but now, now you guys can do that too. Um, now here, here's an example of two different stands. These are both DNR stands, but the one on the left surprisingly had some nice little poles in it. We, we cut 30s and 35s out of there, and the one on the right, that's a very nice stand of, of Lewis County timber out, at, out on uh, um, Lincoln Creek Road. Got some nice poles out of there. And 
that pretty much concludes it for me. Here's a list of contacts and buyers. My name, we have Matt Roth that works for us. Uh, he works out of Tacoma, but he goes anywhere. Charlie Slaymaker uh, works out of Rochester, but he goes everywhere. Melinda Vandehey, she covers um, our southern Washington, but we all go down there too. Um, and Evan Horton is, is our buyer up in or Arlington. But we, we do a lot of, like log trucks, we go bo all directions. It's usually uh, relationship-based. That's pretty much what I have for you guys. Uh, what kind of questions do you have? Yes? What percentage of the poles are used for electricity versus telephone? Uh, they're all the, we, we, we call them all utility poles. Okay. It's not because they're all they're all hung on the same uh, power power pole. So they call them telephone poles, but they're usually the the phone lines are hung on the the power poles. And what we're seeing is an increase in size. So a class 445 used to be the most popular. Now you'll see a lot of utilities in California, especially they've gone to a 245, which increased top size, more stout because it they hang more weight on it. Fiber optics, cable, uh, all sorts of different things. Um, one thing I didn't mention is most of the poles that we send down to California and the Southwest are now fire wrapped. Um, it, it essentially fireproofs them. So you'll, you'll see poles going down that look like maybe they're, they, they're covered in blankets, individual blankets, and it's a, it's a fireproofing. And from what I'm told, it's the same What's inside that blanket is the same substance, which is in like, uh, you know, the 4th of July snakes that you'd like that expand. So they get hot, they, the, the jackets or whatever that are on those poles, they puff up and they provide insulation to the poles and prevent them from burning. And it, it's very effective. And uh, that, that fiber, fiber can be placed after, after it's been activated. So, Rick, do you have any kind of like rule of thumb, like if somebody's harvesting ten acres or something? I mean, and they want we'll come and look at almost everything. Oh, good, sorry. Yeah, I mean, I, I've got. Yeah, if 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 there's a a half acre of of decent wood and you think you can get twenty five or thirty poles out of it, we'll come and have a look. That's part of what we do. So, when you're looking around the poles, how many, what percent of, out of stands usually do you get of poles? I mean, like if we're buying a, a DNR timber sale or bidding on a DNR timber, we're looking for about 20% or more. Um, sometimes private stands have more than that. They might have 10% or 5%. It, it, it just varies. But if we, if we can get a load of poles out and we think it's going to benefit you guys and us too, then we'll come and have a look. Steve, what's, what's the average age of this pole, do you think? Our average age is probably, including the, the state and federal wood we buy and then the private wood, it's probably around 60 years. Yeah. So we're, we're concerned about the rotation age. Um, you know, I, we'll always be able to get 35s, 40s, and 45s, but th there is a demand, and especially right now, our, our demand for transmission for 60 foot plus is fairly high, and that goes for our competition too. So there's a lot of projects across the nation that are asking for that taller wood, and that's why that's why I think our area is so unique, and it, geographically it's so small that I, I hate seeing poles get cut up into, into logs. How do you convince your logging contractor that there's some quality poles in there, but like he says, it's just... That's a tough one. Um, the contractors we hire cooperate with us, or they wouldn't work for us. But the contractors you hire, it, 
it, it can vary and it, it can be difficult. And we've run into cases where we've gone out and marked poles and the logger just cut them into logs anyway. Uh, that's disappointing. But in the end, it, I don't think in some ways, you know, some other outfits will pay an extra 10 bucks a thousand or whatever, or whatever per ton to make poles. And you might incentivize them to do that. And that might be helpful. Um, if they're not willing to do that, I, I don't know that I'd hire them because they're not looking out for your best interest. on who's logging it. So I you've talked to Charlie about some of the loggers, potential loggers on, on your land. Um, it depends on who you hire. Um, there's some loggers, we, like I said, it, it, it's a waste of our time. They will cut more poles than we can mark. Whereas other loggers, if they didn't have any experience, we would come out and mark poles for them. Yeah. Or at least maybe do a sample marking and, and show them what we're looking for. Cedar, cedar poles are a diminishing resource, and we are all fighting each other uh, to be able to buy cedar poles. So yeah, you'll see the cedar pole prices are very high. If you look at some of the, the sort sale prices for the DNR, shocking prices. 